Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. But Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court. And they retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. The abbeys were amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. While the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a mass ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade, but first let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In the middle of each, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor. These windows were of stained glass, whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That of the eastern extremity was hung blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third, green throughout. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange. The fifth with white. The sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon the carpet of the same material. Paints here were scarlet, a deep blood color. There stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illuminated the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. In the black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme. It was in this apartment also that there stood the gigantic clock of ebony. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound of so peculiar a note and emphasis that the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance. And thus the waltzers, perforce, ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a, a light laughter at once pervaded in the assembly. The musicians looked at each other nervously and smiled at their own folly and made whispering vows that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then, the lapse of 60 minutes, there came another chiming of the clock and the same disconcert. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine 
right eye for color and effects. It was his own guiding taste which gave character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. And the revel went whirlingly on until at length there commenced sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolution of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. And thus, too, it happened that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who became aware of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence, having spread itself, was spreading around. There arose at length from the whole company a buzz, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. See now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded at the grave. The mask which concealed his vision, visage was made nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse. And yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Pros Prospero fell upon the spectral image, he was convulsed. In the first moment, with a strong shudder, either of terror or disgust, but in the next, with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know who we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. First, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement in the direction of the intruder, who now, with deliberate and stately step, made a closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were none found who had put forth a hand to seize him. It was then that Prince Prospero Maddened with rage, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure. When the latter had became the extremity of the building apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped, gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which, instantly afterwards, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and, seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless, within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror, and finding the grave and corpse-like mask untenanted by any tangible form.
tears in the blood bejeweled walls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the day. And the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all.